The early to mid 2000s I think is really the golden age for Star Wars video games. On the PC we had Jedi Outcast, Republic Commando and Battlefront 2. And on the PlayStation 2 and the GameCube we had Star Wars Bounty Hunter. Which is one of those games that you could bring up in conversation at any time and find no shortage of people who'd look back on it fondly. And that's for good reason, it was a pretty damn fun game that got released on arguably one of the best generations of consoles ever. At a time when the Star Wars franchise was unironically in better hands than it is now. I'll take that off your hands. Uh, how much you offering? Your life. Developed by LucasArts in 2002, it came out around the same time as the second film, Attack of the Clones. And it was released back when it was still exciting to play a game set in the Star Wars universe. And as much as I might hate Star Wars these days, there's still something about the setting and those classic iconic sound effects that I'll always enjoy hearing and probably never get sick of. Now with this game there were two different versions, there was one for the PlayStation 2 and one for the GameCube, and like it always was back then, the PlayStation 2 version was usually the worst one off. On the GameCube version, as an example, Django's character model has almost twice the amount of polygons as the PlayStation 2 version, along with more realistic looking shadows, and I think that alone pretty much opens and closes the book on which version is better. I think the only benefit to the PlayStation 2 version is that Django's armor is shiny. Still, either way though, you're getting the same game at its core. This is Star Wars through and through. From the opening title crawl to those trademark establishing shots of a spacecraft flying past the camera towards a nearby planet. Bounty Hunter tells an interesting story too. It takes place before the events of the second film, as Django captures the attention of Count Dooku and Darth Sidious, who then hire him to track down a dark Jedi named Kamari Vosa, who happens to be Dooku's former apprentice. We cannot allow any further disruptions. If these bounty hunters surface again... And she kind of looks like a combination of Bridget Nielsen and Goza from Ghostbusters. Kamari shows up during one cinematic near the beginning of the game, and then, unless I missed it, she only shows up again towards the end of the game. When she then straddles Django like she's a goddamn horn dog, or, I don't know, a horn taco, I guess. <laughs> Thankfully too, Vosa is the only one in the entire game who actually pulls out a lightsaber. Which is a good thing because that weapon was completely oversaturated in the series at the time. Honestly, after seeing Luke tear ass in the original trilogy, I'd never have thought that it was possible to make a lightsaber seem boring. But with the prequel films, man, they sure found a way to pull that off. Anyway, what ensues is actually a pretty awesome backstory, showing how Django first met Zam Wessel, along with how he's acquired Slave One, which in my opinion might be one of the coolest spaceships in the Star Wars universe, outside of, obviously, the Millennium Falcon and the X-Wing. <laughs> Count Dookie putting out a $5 million hit on Vosa was a means of having someone deal with her as a threat to his plans, but also helping him find a suitable bounty hunter to form the basis for the clone army. I shall accomplish both of these tasks with a single stroke, Master. And let's face it, those clones and all their various side stories is one of the few good things to come out of the prequel films. It hits all of the beats you'd want to see in a Star Wars game. You get to explore Coruscant, Malastare, Tatooine and Penrith. There's interactions with Jabba the Hutt and Jango's buddy Rosada, who's a female version of Watto from The Phantom Menace. And thankfully, about the only connection to that film in this entire game. There's even the odd Wilhelm scream thrown in here and there when an enemy dies. Jeremy Soule, who worked on the Elder Scrolls games, among a whole heap of others, also does some of the music in the soundtrack. But like any Star Wars game, the best bits are when you hear those recognisable excerpts from John Williams' score. I mean, it's almost mandatory for this stuff to be in any Star Wars game, and you really wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> it's a game from a time that now feels like ancient history, when the Star Wars universe still had a bit of soul left in it, and they hadn't milked the tits of the franchise to the point where that milk had started to turn into powder. It's a well-known fact that Boba Fett is one of the coolest motherfuckers in all of science fiction, an absolute legend, emphasized even more by the fact that he really had such little screen time and barely uttered an entire sentence. No disintegration. As you wish. So the next best thing after that is his old man, Django. And although Django does talk a whole lot in this, really only because it wouldn't make for an interesting story if he didn't, I think he still comes across as a likeable character. That ship is mine. 
which is at odds though with the fact that otherwise he's pretty much a gun for hire with some razor thin moral principles. I don't know any Vosa! Gotta say too, I always kind of found it funny how almost every single piece of side media that tells a story relating to Attack of the Clones always managed to do a better job of it than what the film could. I mean, Attack of the Clones, for instance, is kind of terrible. The Clone Wars cartoon, though, is amazing. Same thing with Django as a character. In the film, it kind of felt like they seriously underplayed his abilities. Despite being a bounty hunter and supposedly one of the best in the galaxy, the guy still got in a brawl with a Jedi at close range, and then didn't have the common sense to learn from that later on against another Jedi that was clearly storming towards him for what is obviously going to be a killing blow. Yeah, not the time to lose one's head. Oh, sorry, too soon? In the game though, he's portrayed as being a stone cold badass, and this time, you actually buy it. At one point he even drops a guy off a building that's like a bajillion stories high, all for the sake of a badass one-liner. Release him! Now! As you wish. No, wait! No! It is kind of weird though how the story in this almost ends on a happy note, hinting at Django and Zam's partnership being one that's only going to improve, as if they're walking off at the end of Casablanca like Humphrey Bogart and Claude Rains. We're going to split the bounty 50-50, right? Don't push your luck, Zam. Of course though, we all know how it really turns out. I'm sorry, spoiler. <laughs> Now the gameplay in this is a combination of a platformer and a third person shooter and I'd say it's roughly a 60-40 ratio of combat to platforming. Probably the most important gadget in Django's arsenal is the jetpack. You play for the first 20 or so minutes without it but once you finally get your hands on this thing, it's easily one of the most used, not to mention the coolest tools at your disposal. The longer you hold down the button, the higher this thing goes and then moving in a direction after that is going to maintain its elevation. Elevation. Fuck! The longer you hold down the button, the higher this thing goes, and then moving in a direction after that is going to maintain your elevation. But this thing burns out faster than a keg of Mountain Dew at a Reddit meetup, so you've got to keep your eye on its fuel supply and let it recharge. And you really do feel like one of the galaxy's biggest chads when you're flying around and gunning down enemies. Also, little known fact about game design, and that's that jetpacks improve everything. Yeah, everything. So it's a great idea when they take it away from you for some of the later levels. You can also jump, dodge roll and crouch along with grabbing and hanging off ledges. It's a smooth, fluid control scheme that does feel janky at times, considering it's going on almost 20 years old now, but it is still easy to play with. Other than that, you've got Django's twin blasters, which make up the absolute abundance of combat in this game, with a sound effect that's going to be burnt into your brain by the time you finish. Bounty Hunter has one of the most liberal auto-aim systems you're ever going to see, and once you've locked onto someone, it is pretty hard to lose them. Just a shame that the range for the lock-on is kind of short, and it can also be downright stupid at times, choosing to aim at someone on the other side of the planet as opposed to someone standing right in front of you. The speed at which you can shoot these things really just comes down to how quickly you can mash that fire button. It never runs out of ammo or even overheats and there's even a cool feature where Django can target different enemies with each blaster, aiming in separate directions which is an awesome attention to detail. Other weapons include a poison dart which is able to kill almost every single enemy in a single hit. And yeah, I know it's supposed to be based off the weapon he used in the second film. <laughs> But what it really reminds me of are those cufflinks that Frank Drebin gets in The Naked Gun. You've got a flamethrower, which can only be used when standing still for some reason. But all you've got to do is touch an enemy and then they're lit up, running around and screaming for a bit before dying. Get a nice group of bad guys standing together and you can make quick work of them with this thing. And it becomes almost essential to use against some of the tougher enemies in these later levels. For capturing bounties, which I'll talk more about in a little bit, you've got the lasso, which seems a lot like the one Boba used against Luke in Return of the Jedi. But you have to be standing really close to someone for it to be used effectively. The grenade though, I think, is probably the most useless weapon of the bunch. Only because enemies aren't really in the habit of standing still and waiting for a grenade to blow up in their face. Also, Django seems to throw this thing like he's on the moon or something and it moves really slowly. Thankfully, the missile launcher on the back of the jetpack makes up for this. I mean, not only does this thing seek out enemies automatically, but it also has a pretty large area of effect. 
It's a shame though that swapping between these isn't very smooth or seamless. You can either scroll through them one by one or bring up a menu that pauses the game and then select an item manually. I think if these were bound to their own individual buttons on the controller, it just would have been a lot better. Even with all of these weapons and gadgets, the combat still becomes very repetitive very quickly. And it seems the game doesn't really know how to change things up all that much, the further you get into the campaign either. Just seems the best they could come up with is just throwing more and more enemies at you. And by the time you get to Tatooine, you'll have a couple of dozen guys attacking you at once. Just becomes the very definition of mindless. The level after that when you're taking on Tusken Raiders and even more generic enemies is one of the worst things ever designed by another human being. With snipers perched up on nearby ledges you often can't even see. And don't even get me started on the boss fight at the end of that chapter either. When you're stuck taking a big bite out of the shit sandwich that is a lot of these later levels, you'll really start to understand why this thing got average reviews from critics back in the day. I mean my thumb got such a workout from mashing that fire button over and over, that by the time I finally finished the game it had a goddamn six pack. You can also pick up the occasional side weapon like a rifle, heavy blaster and even a grenade launcher but these kinda suck. I think you get the grenade launcher for maybe a single level in the entire game, the same with the rifle which shows up early on but then just never again. And the heavy gun is the most frequent but it still really doesn't do that much more damage than your blasters. Either way though, you're gonna die a whole heap in this thing and it gets exponentially more challenging the further you get into the game. And you know what, if you manage to beat this thing back in the day, well then my hat goes off to you. I mean it's one hell of an accomplishment because this game really does not fuck around. Another one of the game's biggest issues is the camera which just like a lot of games from that same era is often complete dog shit. Also annoyingly panning the camera left and right is inverted so when you turn left it goes right and when you turn right it goes left but up and down though strangely isn't. And while there's an option to toggle the Y axis there's not one for the Z axis which is about the most bizarre thing I've ever seen in a video game. You also have to quit out of the game back to the main menu to change the controls anyway. You can't even do it during a level. But I think the absolute main issue with Bounty Hunter is how you hunt bounties because it's been integrated in a way that doesn't really work seamlessly with the gameplay. You see, you're not going to know if someone's a bounty or not unless you first scan them. To do this you've got to change to Django's visor mode then manually zoom in and scan every NPC directly. Now look, this is fine on levels where things are a little bit more slow paced. Like on Coruscant, people are just walking down the street and some of them might happen to have a bounty. You can whip out that scanner and find these targets at your own pace. Just becomes a bit of an issue when the game decides to put a bounty on some generic looking enemy that happens to be thrown in with 10 others during combat, which is what happens for 80% of the levels in the game. So the only way to find these guys is to often pull your scanner out in the middle of a gunfight, which leaves you completely defenseless, as you try to scan them one by one to see if someone is an actual target. You've got to put your blaster away, scroll through your available items, activate the scanner and then pan around the screen tagging enemies. I mean it's like trying to make a cup of tea inside a line enclosure. Bounties can also be captured dead just for half the cash. But still, it doesn't count if you haven't scanned the target to begin with. So you can't even cheese this by just going around and pressing interact on corpses and hoping you get lucky. It's a bit of a shame that a mechanic that forms the entire basis for your character's existence just hasn't been implemented all that well. I think it would have been better if we knew who these targets were from the start, right? And then it was the decision of whether or not you take them out lethally or choose to get in close for the non-lethal takedown. Instead, scanning hundreds if not thousands of NPCs for the 10 or so per level that you actually need is a terrible idea, and it should have never made it into the finished game like this. <laughs> Capturing these guys you do get extra credits which is then spent on unlocking concept art, but that's about the most unimpressive thing ever. I mean if it unlocked cheats or new skins or something like that, well it might have been worth it. I hate to admit it but you're worth more alive. Bounty Hunter isn't the longest game ever made either, it's around 6 or 7 hours. And probably even less if you decide to forego trying to catch every single bounty, which I know I did. But I'd say for maybe a third of the campaign you are going to feel every minute and second of those 6 to 7 hours. Because there is some stuff in the latter half of this game that is pure, unfiltered, primo grade 6th generation console bullshit. 
I'm talking about long, repetitive levels and sadistic platforming that really does seem like it's trying to take the piss. It's the kind of stuff that really builds character. One of the worst ones is where you've got to blast your way through an entire prison to find your target. Then after that, you've got to shut down a force field reactor to then be able to hijack a ship and escape. This requires navigating to three identical rooms and shutting down three separate generators. But it's literally just the same three generator rooms over and over, with similar looking corridors leading to each of them, and it's just so boring. The Death Stick Factory is the kind of level that only a kid who hasn't yet discovered alcohol, drugs, or sex could possibly find entertaining. It really just seems like a level designed for a 13 or 14 year old, with nothing better to do than retry something over and over because it's the only way to pass the time. And look, I get it, I really do. I played games back then too, and there was definitely a sense of games from that period, often being designed in a way that seemed to purposefully increase their longevity through padding and artificial bullshit often as a means of extending the value you got out of the purchase. This was before we had sites like Metacritic or YouTubers reviewing games in often needless detail on launch. So when you bought something almost blindly, you really wanted to make sure you got your money's worth, considering a lot of the time you'd have to hassle your parents to buy these games for you in the first place. I mean, I still remember hassling my dad to buy me 007 Nightfire, and then that I also finished it that same afternoon. So in a weird way, there's almost a justification for the challenge, because you're spending full price on something and you want to get your money's worth. Look, my point to all of this rambling is, I get it. I mean, it's just that playing it now as an adult with shit to do, your mum leaving me voicemails and bills to pay, well, it kind of often seems like a frustrating waste of time. Whenever you're killed in the game, and yes, you will be killed, you restart back to the nearest checkpoint. In this, they're glowing Mandalorian daggers that you collect. But instead of a checkpoint, it basically works as a respawn, keeping your progress up until that point. So all of the enemies you've killed stay dead. But if you end up losing all of those remaining lives, you then need to replay the entire mission from scratch. And it's just a bit of a weird idea, why they didn't just include some kind of traditional checkpoint system. Overall, Star Wars Bounty Hunter is a product of its time in two huge ways. It epitomizes early 2000s video game design, and it epitomizes Star Wars transmedia storytelling, and captures the feeling and the tone perfectly of a bygone era for the franchise. I'm allowing you to tag along because you might be useful. Despite the issues that this thing has, being a game made in 2002, I'd still play an Attack of the Clones based video game any day of the week, over a Rise of Skywalker or The Last Jedi game. So yeah, Star Wars Bounty Hunter may not have aged well, and it might often seem crushing and unbalanced, but it still does however have one very important ingredient, and that's soul. And soul, I think, is something that can often elevate a game above its problems and shortcomings. I'm afraid he doesn't have much more to say. He just froze up on me. It's like how Han Solo described the Millennium Falcon. It may not look like much, but it's got it where it counts. 